Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to this webinar series. Um, I will uh, give you and talk about um, a deeper view into adult learning and adult uh, education under temporal reconstructions, um, I call it, uh, because it starts with a specific um, perspective which might be also repeated, not repeated, but come back um, in another presentation in this webinar series by colleague Hervé Breton. I will focus on biography and biographical temporalizations, as you have already said, Michelle. Today is more about um, one uh, specific focus. It is a kind of... Um, Yes, uh, it, I, I dropped it out from, from all my research I do now um, for more than 20 years about time and temporal aspects in adult education and learning. And when I started research about time and learning more than 20 years ago, I worked uh, firstly in an interdisciplinary context. It was a research program together with colleagues, especially from social uh, um, and economic science. Uh, we came together from different universities and we did research here in Germany about time policies in adult education. And the focus was very much on legal regulations um, in that time. It was about the creation and especially the protection of time for learning in adulthood, mostly related to the biographical phase of employment and the idea of balancing learning and uh, all these other time consuming activities we are doing in daily life tasks within daily life tasks and protect learning times from these concurrences. I did research about the European and also international legislation, for example, the paid educational leave, as well as on union collective agreements and personal in company agreements here in Germany. And, and at that time, I came to the point that I said, no, I have to widen my view. I would like to go beyond these approaches, very much functional orientated to time and temporalities. And I grabbed up um, epistemological conceptions considered to philosophical and sociological um, concepts and theories and approaches to time. And this is only a short, um, yes, a, a short picture, a small, very small picture of, uh, of all what I have used at that time. And at the same time, I had the feeling that um, a kind of a genuine pedagogical theory of time is really missing. Many texts are implicitly using time concepts and talking about time aspects, temporal criteria, but only some small texts at that time we had in Germany who really explorate time and temporal aspects. And even we don't have studies at that time, we don't have a kind of an empirical base or fundament. So I started to develop a theoretical and empirical based heuristic module about temporal implications. You can see here the, the small circles. Um, so I have tried to explore how temporal basic references we can all meet in our modern lives, for example, in transformative dynamics, chronotopies, etc. And how these temporal basic references relate to self relationships to time when we are learning um, and uh, how these are intertwined and mutually conditioned. I missed at that time also very much the explicit voices of the learners. Um, we had many, many professional or political expectations, but how do the learner experience their time while or when learning? And why does it be, why is it so different? And, and for what reason it differs and changes? Well, and this perspective actually accompanies me uh, till today, currently. I lead the research project with two young colleagues also here today about time and learning in adulthood on the reconstruction of temporalities and time modalities in different learning settings of adult and continuing education. It is founded by the German Research Foundation and it will run till next year. The study examines the configuration of time-related structures and practices in 
courses. We have also face-to-face -face courses and online courses. And we are, um, we are bringing to, together these collective temporalities and individual time mortalities. And I bring today some of the interviews here as an example. Always again and again in all these things, biographical aspects and the perspectives on personal life courses popped up or yes, and I met them and guided me to different questions and uh, also um, guided me um, within the interpretation and my research. And I found that there are several studies and quite, I would say, outstanding theoretical works and texts about biographical aspects in adult education. But again, you have to search for explicit um, temporal and time related uh, things. But there are aspects like narrating one's own life as doing biography, like Peter Alheit named it, or uh, also the dialogical um, potential of narration uh, for um, biographical understanding, uh, like Abbe Breton um, pointed out. So they all open to us a time sensitive approach for reconstructing and understanding how do people develop and unfold their identity throughout the context of lifelong learning and how is time echoed in and through learning and can be narrated. My aim in this webinar is to show and discuss with you where and how time and temporary aspects may pave the way for a more diversified approach and concept of biographical understanding in education and research of these. This means a very specific use of personal life and I use here Michelle's <laughs> Um, quotation which gives you a, a short but a very complex summary of full important keywords I would say which mostly mm, comes up when we're talking about biographical uh, the function and role of biographical work in adult educator about it it is part of a professional method it is part of the personal life histories we are meeting in our professional work and i would say it is a kind of a methodological source opener to understand life courses and learning biographies better and even uh, what what do we infect when we are working with people and i'm absolutely convinced that such material based on individual narrations written or told as autobiographical or biographical constructs of lived times can enrich our professional work in practice and also in research. But I would like to stop here for a moment and gather some of your associations or experiences in advance. I would like to invite you to do a brainstorming. I prepared and hopefully it will work a Mentimeter and you can use here to answer the question where do you estimate, or maybe you already know from your work, your research, your experience, where are biographical aspects of interest, helpful, relevant, et cetera, et cetera, for our understanding of lifelong and life-wide learning? What do they tell us, these histories? What do we collect? What do we additionally know? What maybe we don't know? Uh, all these. You can use here the QR code. You can also type in menti.com in your smartphone. You can use your smartphone or your computer, whatever is available for you. <clears throat> and the idea is to collect in a yes, to collect your associations in the next two minutes. And while you are doing this, I will stop here the presentation, move to the web page, and then later on. We are coming back to the slides. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe some more is coming in. And if you see it here uh, more big printed, you can transitions is then more often used. And many, many things are coming up. Thank you so much for your brainstorming. I think it is not the idea now to to cluster this and and um but what can be kept here is 
um, that you find uh, what yes, like maybe maybe what what can um, biographies uh, tell us? They can't only tell us something about the individual or the subject or the person, but it can take about the context. You are talking here about the world through world view. It can also tell us something about time regimes, for, uh, for example, the acceleration. Maybe it's also here the topic of arrhythmia. I'm not sure about virtualization or the, the future expectations um, or orientations. Mm, biographies can also open social patterns of time especially in education, for example, the idea of classes synchronicity of the vision of 7 to 45 flexibility in digitalization or uh, what you are talking about, um, a kind of learning resistance or specific attitudes in society, but also in classes and so in courses or also in individual livings. And it can explore about individual time modalizations within learning, the linearity, the rush hour of life. Um, it can prompt a dialogue, somebody um, wrote, or it can help us to negotiate new meanings somebody else wrote. So I would like to stop this here. Thank you, thank you very much. I can save this as well because it's anonymous. And if you like, we can put this in the slides or maybe um, we can share um, or save this on Padlet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And coming back now, I, I say maybe it, it is clear that biographical work can act as an enabler, can give us or can open us space to work with narrations and think about narratives and biographies. The, the, um, the learners are um, coming with to our uh, work, to our courses, to our consolations, etc. So the next topic is a little bit more general. I would like to start with some pre preliminary thoughts more generally on biography. And firstly, um, to mention Nasse here, uh, analogous to history as a processual self-reference biographies also in general can be understood as a self-reference by either oral or written descriptions. A person observes and narrates in the now and the present and the yet a series of events happens in the past or expected to come and thus refers to him or herself in a processual self-referenced way. This um, kind, this process of doing is here um, kept by Stolarski's um, quotation. Biography or the narration of it is not identical with the course of life and with what apparently really happened. In no way, historical time can be assumed to be a reality in biographical narratives. And I uh, put in here only to mention that even the historians who are usually committed to very much chronology and a strict linear time demarcation by uh, talking about epoch, uh, epochs, etc., they come up with history as a temporal relational phenomenon. Koselek speaks about embedded time layers and levels. Um, uh, Carola Rothauge uh, said, okay, we have to do really a temporal turn in history as well. And others like Söhner says that past, past is always understood as inner history. And this is the background. And also the idea of biography is um, that the frame of reference is a person's biological lifetime. But I would say this frame of reference only touches the complexity of biography. And I would do four steps now in my in the next uh, minutes. First, I would like to talk about the historical development and the pre-requirements of biography, the historical background. I would uh, like to do an interlacing uh, for biographical time, like Carmen Lecardi says, within these three dimensions of past, present, and future, 
as a permanent construction and reconstruction in ever new frameworks of meaning. So this is Lekadis Carmen's um, uh, definition. And I will point on the double time perspective of narrated time and narrating time in biographical texts and elaborate the literary concept of temporal indexicality a little bit um, for us. So to start um, and come here uh, to biographical um, in the history, um, um, it was um, kind, it, it was a parallel movement within the modern idea that the nature of time is not an objective and given fact, but can and for that should be shaped um, like Sorokin and Metzesen and is more and more a matter of individual responsibility, of individual decisions, a kind of a um, symbol for individualization um, and it creates a zeitgeist. This is an absolutely essential basic a spirit of time from which the notion of autobiography could emerge in the very first place. It was the upcoming idea of reflecting identity, a form of ordering one's personal development in becoming a self, especially since the second half of the 18th century an era in social situation arose that accords higher self-esteem. And the idea and the paradigm and even I, I would say the principle of individualization was born at that time till not as we expect it today as a kind of a personal optimization or a kind of going beyond a digital performance by public recognition like nowadays. But this period in Europe is often thought to be the starting point of biographical forms of self-presentation. Um, there is a, a colleague of mine, uh, Brumlik, he talks that autobiographical, he talks about motives can be already in, indeed seen and found much, much earlier on grand victory stays of the ancient Near East. Also in these judgments of the dead, they have been known since the second millennium before Christ. And later on in early modern period, there are kind of a first biographic, biographical reflections, mostly religiously used and then transformed in so-called conscience tracts and sin biographies. So they work or functions as a kind of a self-disciplining instrument in these early periods. All in all, a certain kind of sensitivity to time is requi required to encourage personal reflections and to transcend them from the linear form of a life's chronicle. More and more, the individual in modernity is being personalized and its identity is now based on a temporal structure equivalent, a colleague of mine, Heide von Felsen says, to the model of dynamic identity, equivalent to the society, dynamic society movement and transformation. What lacks identity, Böhm says, because it is in a constant state of flux, it's liquid, light moment says, regains identity by creating a temporalized context. This can happen, for example, by narrating or in narration. As temporalized individual, the subject and its identity, um, it's a um, temporal narration, Ulrike would say, and also like Harry Faser talked about some weeks ago, also in this webinar, it's part of temporal imagination. And all these movements became the heart of biographical research in history, literature, educational sciences, et cetera, et cetera. The self-presence of consciousness and its expression is highly relevant for biographical narrations and narratives. So I would come to the next point. It is the idea of how these narrations and how these 
self-present movements can be translated in a kind of a of a um, of a spoken thing or written thing in narratives. So um, uh, maybe very often um, to understand better the, the construction between um, the interlacings of the three temporal dimensions, past, present, and future, very often McTaggart's um, uh, um, book is mentioned at that time, and he uh, speaks about time relations and it its paradox, also Beery later on related to him in his um, uh, philosophical, uh, psychological um, approaches. And McTaggart makes a difference between A series and B series. B series are an event that is earlier than other will always remain so and will never be later than it, just as the later of two events can never become the earlier. And the same applies to the simultaneity. So therefore, B series are immutable and constant. The A series indifferent, on the other hand, means that events are relational themselves. This order, unlike the first, is not constant. An event that is present was once future and will once be past. And going further and beyond this problem of a paradox of un or in the unreality of time or different paradox realities of time, I would say, maybe um, could bring us a step forward is uh, Husserl's phenomenology of internal time consciousness. Husserl formulates this how of a temporal setting in relation as a play of the internal and the external. It's a play of real events and lived experiences as well as sensations. So the emotional constructions within. This helps, I would say, in my understanding to unpack the process of doing biography and uno acto doing identity formation. According to Husserl, there's a kind of an internal time consciousness because we continue to produce ever new levels in different modes of presentifications. He, he talks about vergegenwärtigung, means presentification. And presentification is very important for biographical identity, uh, work, and narration. And it is Husserl's idea of a presentification, not just as a remembering the past, but doing it in different um doing it different ways. So there are the retentions. These are primary memories in the sense of a flow of a consciousness. For example, we need these retentions. Otherwise, we would not be able to listen to music and to hear music. Music is not only um, the individual tone, single by single, add to add a tone, but it is remembering, re having these primary remembers memories that we can can follow uh, a, a music flow. And also there's a forward looking, there's a pro tension in it. We expect to have uh, the next tone coming. And for example, in the modern music, we have the idea of irritating the flow of consciousness because maybe something uh, we expect something different, what is then coming, or we can fulfill these pretensions. And what I like in Husserl's thinking is that he does not differentiate between objectivity and subjectivity, but between reality and consciousness, between the world and the way we experience and, and how we experience and perceive it. The fact that the stream of consciousness by himself is also a self-reflexive process and is possible to reflect by ourselves, reflected by ourselves, is highly relevant. He say we can grasp it, we can observe how it is continuously changing from face to face. And such reflexive moments of a stream of a consciousness do neither unfold, I think this is the most interesting, in a chronologic nor in a linear way, in a linear way. Reflections are moving around between past, present, and future relations. Mm -hmm. They are as narrations as well as written texts, for example, 
um, in from participants in our adult education. They example, for example, they appear as long lasting memories when somebody says, in my childhood, I was already interested in, or in short retentions. Since I started this course, I or as present moment, now when I'm here learning together with the others, or in future pretensions, when I know more about, I will start. Such interlacing of the three time dimensions are very, very important and strong moments to start learning beside of doing other things, maybe uh, to ignore or avoid problems or differences which appear in our life. So it can, it can be made visible in biographical narrations. And I have a quote from uh, a woman um, we took two years ago um, and she did formal learning in a course and it was then shifted um, online during the pandemic. And her, um, her uh, this quotation shows very much how she reflects learning from past experiences and how they are presented until now. Maybe you can read by yourself. So the part of the interlacing all three dimensions here in this quotation is quite strong. It means looking back at the past from the present, thus creating connections. Past events in, are being recalled, like the quotation shows, recalled in mind and thus often modified um, in new ways. It is uh, re also by this often revalued which can be understood as a process of unfolding strong impacts. It's like this kind of healing into the here and now to engage into learning activities, as well as very much into what comes maybe in the future, the personal growth. But let me make it a little bit more complex. Um, there are not only this simple, past, present, and future dimensions, but we have temporal differentiations. We have deeper relational interlacings within the modes. So I'm referring to um, Klaus Kornwax. Uh, he's a philosopher, and he wrote a book about logic of time and time of logic. And this um, concept tries to interlace in a more deeper analytical differentiation um, the dimensions. So for example, there is the future of the future. Uh, also, yes, and I have to mention here that I, I use the German designation still in the table because otherwise it would be difficult a little bit within the ordering because in, in English we have P and P for past of present and also for present of present. So I stick to the German abbreviations here in this table. So there's the future of the future. It's the, potential, the potentiality of the possible. It's the openness in principle, Kornwag says. And there's also the past of the future. We have a German spoken verb, which means too old to die young. This demonstrates as a way of speaking, the limitation of possibilities, the ways of anticipating the future change in such a way that drafts are put uh, away or put aside, not only um, uh, always th that we wish to put it aside, but the time uh, time goes further, time runs. This past is no longer caught up by future events, like Convax says, but remains us as an unrealized plan. And we can't make it happen because it's gone. This time period is gone. And there's the present of the future. This means the inevitability, the multi-possibility becomes real and present. 
that something comes towards us is always inevitable. Thus, the possible, the possible in that it can become actual, it is always present in our mind. And um, to make it maybe more um, metaphoric, um, I put in here this, this the future of the past means traces are erased. So you can see the picture. What has been stored disintegrates. Facts are reinterpreted or even forgotten. And you have, on the other hand, the fixed past of the past. It is the fact of the factual. It is the final convexes, irreversible event. It is set in stone. And I will do now um, pick up two relational time modes very near related to biography and connect them to our empirical material from our research about time and learning. So to come to the present, also just one example, the present of the present, it means by Kornwax, the current transformation of what is stored. For biographical research, along to Husse, it is the recall of personal memories and the presence of narrating. It's the recall of past events and experiences in comparison with present experiences and maybe then the reconstruction. So there is one example. It is taken from an online course. It was a MOOC with more than 1,500 students. Students, it starts September 21 and ends December 21. It was then kept open for a while. It was cost free. It um, includes some open educational resources. It works asynchrone with chats and forum till the end of the opening 2022. And we and um, did some observations, ethnographical observation, but also interviews. And this is now from an interview with Bianca. She puts out here uh, learning time as a positive time out in different phases of her life. And she says, yes. And yes, and for me, learning was always so. So also already to the earlier, my where I still went in presence, in advanced trainings, when the children were still at home, that was somehow my freedom. Hmm. Yes. And it was, and now in the pandemic, that was almost similar. It was like, yes, a time out for the head where you do not think of the chaos of this whole chaos at home. So you see, you see here the present of the present in the chaos. It is a typically... A, it is the hard fact of the present. You can see here also other time interlacings or dimension interlacings. Um, yes, I, but I think the present of the past is, is very clear in this interview. And um, just a short um, idea of the future in the present. These are anticipatory moments, like Kornwag says, it may reach more or less far into the future, but it is in so far um, anticipated in the yet and now because possible events determine current um, um, actings. So every cognitive act, every flight reaction, for example, says Kornwax, has these anticipatory parts. Anticipating, it's, it's the same, um, uh, I, I took here the, the same case, also the MOOC, but another person, it is Barbara now talking, and it is her anticipating of ongoing time conflicts, which causes the dropout. Also, she already started the MOOC and successfully completed some pieces. She gave up by anticipative looking on the future of the present. And she could not even explain, and this is very important, it's a kind of a preemption. It's taking the future as so real now because it is not relational reasoning, she says, but then at some point, I just feel like con not continue for whatever reason. So she, so it is not a rational reason, but she's acting, she's dropping out. Okay, 
And now I will end with some short um, views into the difference between narrated time and maybe you have a lot of ideas now, narrating time and temporal indexicality. Narration of a personal history provides material required for temporal indexical analysis. And I would very much recommend to come back again in two weeks and to listen to Hervé Breton because he's talking about the kinetic variations of temporalities in narrations. And this is a little bit more deeper in step into these indexicalities I will talk about. Um, <clears throat> so what biographies and the narration, uh, narrations include are explicit temporal vocabulary. You can see it's now, it's um, then, it's later, etc. And you have this implicit contextual knowledge about time and phenomenon, which is embedded in as time experiences in relation of the self and the world to time. For narratives and narration, the context dependency of language in space and time, this temporal indexicality plays a very important role in biographical research. First of all, biographical research in educational sciences differentiates, therefore, between this double perspective, double time perspective, narrated time and narrating time. The moment, the moment of narrating is temporarily just as relevant as the temporalities in the narrative itself. And I, I think Avi will talk about the second, the narrative itself. There is the perspective of the narrated time, which is the time in which the story took place with its orientation on or attunement to the present of the past, if we take convex again. And there is the prospect of the narrating time as the time in which the story is told. The here and the now of the storytelling, the current orientation center is, uh, is this storytelling. Whereas the narrated time is a time which is recounted, the time in which the story took place, the narrating time refers to the concrete situation and the present situation of narrating. And this is very much related to the interaction, the convention of the communication, the role description between the narrator and the interviewer, for example, or the safe portrayal somebody has and through the interviewer's inter influence when listening. Also, not when, not always talking, it's also the non-set, which is very much important. The narrator is telling the story in the present situation of narrating in which collected moments are then reconstructed, retraced and transformed. And this succession of the sentences does not reflect the suc succession of things or of what happened, I, like I have said before in the pre preliminaries. The time of language itself proceeds this, like Leitner says, because narrating always it is a simple fact, he says, always takes time. Language cannot express synchrony in any other way than by diachronic extension. Word follows word and sentence follows sentence. And Leitner says in, in reverse, this suggests that synchrony therefore requires explicit representation in and through language. So at the same time, you need specific words to make the synchrony, for example, visible. And or you can variance your kinetics, uh, like Evie says. This leads to a next temporal particularity. We may be able to experience different things at the same time, but need to describe and narrate them one after the other. These non simultaneity of the simultaneous, like Leitner says, in every narration is reflected in the principle of temporal sequences of spoken words. And we have especially the situation in German language that we can't use 
um, a verb of Zeiten, like you can use timing in English. So you need, again, specific representations when you are narrating. Another temporal particularity is the specific time independency of texts. We can read narratives or listen to them when they are narratives, narrations of spring, we can listen to them in autumn and we can read them recurrently and again and again. But the present moment of telling and narrating and reading and analyzing the narrative, however, cannot and never be repeated. And fourth, narratives also encompasses selections from the entire flow of events of life courses which are then reassembled as sequences with omissions. Narrations encompasses blank spaces, and it is even important what is not said in a narration under biographical understandings. Narratives are able to create their own time by these otherwise formats such as utopia or fictions could never be developed. In narration, there, I would say, or also my colleagues say, is no correct time structure. When the beginning, for example, and the end of an um, occurrence are defined, this is individually and subjectively given. And this is a very, a, this, this is a, a time structure, but uh, there is no need to search for a correct time structure. And last but not least, Maybe we can discuss this later. I find that there, what uh, Avi talks about his um, a kinetic variation, I think this is a, more or less something of a rhythmic indexicality. Narratives contain grammatically different tenses to portray processes, changes, to come up with the dramaturgy. The speech tempo heavily varies. Speech tempo variances depend, for example, also not only on, on the, on the uh, story which is told, but also maybe on peculiarities of localities or of dialects, of languages. There is a huge study by, done by Garhammer in Europe. Um, also, the emotional state is influencing very much uh, this rhythmic indexicalization, the speech tempo. It is uh, studied by Oliviero Moreira within psychotherapeutic, psychotherapeutic situations. And there are also differences between generations, milieus and epochs, expressing cultures of time and temporal structures. And we have very nice studies here done from uh, in divine in different cultures. And what is not under um, um, inquiry now, or what is not really good research, I would say is the digital space. And is, it, is the, it is not enough reflected here, um, but the technique is ahead. And when I think about, of my daughter and how often she uses spoken short messages technically that they can be played twice as fast. So this means double the speed uh, overdub as and pauses. And uh, so the digital influence um, in rhythmic uh, words also plays an important role of um, our conception of time. So come to an end, I would say, to identify temporal semantics and temporal indexicalizations within biographical narrations, because they give us space to do so, can help us to reveal, to unpack, to refine the symbolic character of time, like Elias says. This semantic reinforcement as used in time-related figures of speech, for example, which shape the mindset of an epoch, a generation, a milieu, serves not merely to precisely describe the subjective condition, but rather to provide imaginary anchor points 
of identity formation and our possibility to reconstruct and to understand. And like Kade shows, the interview situation itself comes in the middle of a process in which the currently significant life events are realized and became a specific important point in the biography. And the interview he could show becomes a part of, becomes an important part of biographical processes itself. So the purpose of biographical temporalization is to analytical and untangle the interwoven of the collective times of social patterns of time and their individual perception and possibility of narration for adult education. By using narrative activities, for example, travel and narrations or walking interviews, um, I think Fergal Finnegan talked about this method of walking interviews and their outcomes as text, as autobiographies, etc. This may provide sensitizing insights also about learning transitions, transformation processes and development through adulthood. And I would like to end here with a quote from an adult educator about her personal experience becoming a biographical mentor in adult education. And I would like to close with her quotation. And she says, biographical work for me is a tool to support individual personal growth, a joint research and discovery at eye level in which the direction and intensity are given by the biographer. The mentors accompany the process. The starting point is always a concern for the present. And the starting point is always a concern for the present. So thank you very much. Here are some references, but thank you for your time to listen. And I'm very much looking forward now to your comments. <laughs>